Welcome everyone. Welcome to the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network's second COVID-19 Q&A virtual forum. The topic for today is how sensing and diagnostics can help stop the spread of COVID-19. I'm Professor Justin Gooding from the University of New South Wales and the co-director of the Smart Sensing Network. You'll hear from my co co-director, Professor Ben Eggleton from the University of Sydney throughout the forum and at the end when he wraps up. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognising the continuing connection to land, water and culture. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So what is the forum about? So I think we had the first forum six weeks ago and our world has changed dramatically. Six weeks ago, we were very uncertain about what was happening and now we're starting to emerge from the lockdown, emerge all around the world from the lockdown. And it's really important to reflect at this time, reflect on the tragic loss of lives and livelihood that we're faced, but also important to reflect on what we need to do in the future to limit such pandemics again. There's been huge differences in how countries have suffered from COVID-19. And sometimes those differences are really hard to understand. But the countries that have suffered the least, countries such as Australia, we've been exceptionally lucky and we've done an exceptionally good job, those countries, one thing that is common is they've had very active testing regimes. And we're starting to have words that are now common in our lives. Words such as quantitative polymerized chain reaction or PCR, which has really been the gold standard laboratory method for diagnosing the virus. We've heard a lot and started to be familiar with the ideas of antibody testing. We've had positive and negative views on, on, on the effectiveness of such tests. And many of us have, have been had our temperature measured many, many times a day as we enter buildings, um, just to make sure that we, we are not COVID-19 positive. So what are the merits of these technologies and what technologies are coming in the future? And it's, so it's answering your questions about the pros and cons of these different methods. It's about hearing from the frontline uh, clinicians that have been, been doing the testing, um, epidemiologists have been understanding the pandemic and clinicians treating the disease. The, these are the people you're going to hear from and you're going to hear what, what they would like to have in diagnostics for the future. And you'll hear from the experts on developing smart sensors and what's coming. Um, it is important though that we remember what the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network is about because it's about actually developing these new sensors um, to deal with major environmental, economic and societal challenges. And it's certainly clear that's what we're facing now. It's a, an event that is the most biggest change in our lives for many of us. The Smart Sensing Network is a consortium of universities around New South Wales and the Australian Capital Territory uh, that is funded by the New South Wales government to bring uh, university researchers together with governments, industry and end users to develop important solutions. And as I said, we have a stellar panel of clinicians epidemiologists and smart sensor experts today. So we encourage you, our virtual audience, we encourage you to answer your questions. We already have the questions that you've, where you've put forward, but if as the conversation progresses, another question pops into your mind, don't forget the speech bubble located in the bottom right of your screen, and we'll do our very best to answer as many of your questions as we can. But with no further ado, let's pass over to the expert. Let's pass over to Robin Williams, our host, hosted the last um, forum, will be moderating this forum. And, and Robin is the long-standing host of the ABC Radio Science Show here in Australia. He is one of the voices of, Australia, of science in Australia and has long been a proponent of how science and technology can improve our lives. With, with no further ado, Robin, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Justin. Yes, I've been doing the science show for 45 years non-stop, which is a long time. <laughs> and what I'll do is introduce some of the panel and ask them to give a very, very brief description of what they do. First of all, Wojciech Shonofsky, who's deputy director of the Sydney Nano Institute. Thank you. Uh, I'm the, yes, deputy director of the Sydney Nano Institute, but also associate professor in Sydney School of Pharmacy. And primary focus of my research is development of the next generation therapeutics to actually combat the consequences of the infections which are related to COVID as well, uh, especially focusing on lung disease. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Professor Paul Dastour from the Center of Organic Electronics, University of Newcastle. Organic Electronics. 
Good morning, Robin, and good morning, everyone. Yes, I, I head up a centre here in organic or printed electronics at the University of Newcastle in Australia, where we focus on printing at large scale electronic devices made from in, inexpensive um, organic semiconducting materials. So we can manufacture devices at large scale at extremely low cost. In the context of the present conversation, we're focused on developing new sensors for COVID based on the sort of technologies that we can manufacture at large scale. And so to Professor Ben Eagleton, co-director of the New South Wales Smart Sensor Network and director of the Sydney Nano Institute, Ben. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for that introduction. My own research, as well as having the leadership roles that you just mentioned, Robin, my own research is in photonics using lasers to sense the world around us um, in devices that can be integrated onto a chip scale. And my own research at the moment is particularly interested in sensor fusion, which is a very simple idea, the idea of combining different sensors to provide a more complete picture. And I think that's a relevant theme that I'll pick up in this session this morning. Thank you. And so to Professor Subhas Mukhopadhyay from the School Good morning, of everyone. I'm I'm with Macquarie University. I'm uh, working on the different types of sensors, especially the selective sensors and for remote monitoring in applications like chemical, biological, and healthcare, as well as food monitoring. So in this context, I'll be looking into the different rapid monitoring tests, which can be done in remotely and putting the data to in internet. Thank you. And so to Professor Mary Louise McLaws, epidemiologist of the World Health Organization, and an advisory panel for COVID-19. Oh, good morning, Robin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, panel members. Um, I'm Professor of Epidemiology in Hospital Infection and Infectious Diseases Control, um, and I provide um, advice to the World Health Organization um, on um, things like um, guidelines, uh, approaches, uh, evidence-based uh, knowledge uh, as it uh, relates to COVID-19. Thank you. And next we go to CN Yui, who is uh, from the interventional cardiologist, sorry, he's an interventional cardiologist, Prince of Wales Hospital, sorry. Thanks, Robin. Yes, uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist. I'm a clinician researcher. I've been working for the last four years with Nigel Lovell at the Graduate School of Biomedical Engineering, building a remote monitoring uh, platform for cardiac patients, which we've very rapidly transitioned to be able to remotely monitor COVID positive patients in the community. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Professor Tanya Sorrell, who's director of the Marie Bashir Institute for Infectious Diseases and Biosecurity. Good morning, Robin, and good morning, everybody. Uh, so our institute is really a multidisciplinary institute that aims to uh, prevent the health and socioeconomic consequences of emerging infections. With regard to COVID in particular, my own research is around understanding the clinical problem, the appropriate management technologies and applying the most up-to-date diagnostics to try and help our patients. And to give us a picture of where we're going and what it's all about, now let me introduce the Director of Virology of New South Wales Health to get us underway. Good morning, my name is Bill Rawlinson. I'm, a, uh, I'm the Director of SAVID, which is one or two reference laboratories in New South Wales. Uh, we provide services to adult uh, children and uh, pregnant women. Uh, we've done the largest number of tests so far in the state. I'm a medical virologist with infectious diseases background and um, I've lived through SARS, MERS, Zika virus, pandemic flu, Ebola, and now SARS-2. And um, we have a research interest in a research collaboration with Justin Gooding in the School of Chemistry at UNSW in using uh, nanosensors uh, in detection of respiratory viruses. And have done that now for a couple of years and um, that's working towards a, um, a usable product. Indeed. One of the most exciting things as far as I'm concerned as a viewer if you like a science journalist viewer, is the way in which so many organisations are working together and how that has developed over the last few weeks so spectacularly successfully. And I think that's the state of the future. Let's talk about um, rapid sensing now and go back to Justin Gooding on the way it works. Justin. 
Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, there's a lots of different uh, ways of doing rapid sensing, but the key the key challenge that you face is that there's a small, a very small amount of material that you need to detect, and you and so you need a very very sensitive device. And in our the work that we do with Bill Rowlandson, we use we use nanoparticles that are that scatter different colours of light, and when a single viral molecule, a viral RNA molecule binds to one of these nanoparticles, the, the light the color of the light changes. So that's the way we try and do it, but there are other approaches, but the key, key thing we need is a really, really sensitive detector to detect a really small amount of material so we can detect the virus early. And is the virus just in the blood floating around? So in the work that we do, we go for the sputum. So we've all seen the images of the, of the, the probes going or the swabs going up the nose. So we would take that sample directly, we break open the virus, lyse the virus is the term that we're using, and extract the RNA. That's all done directly on the surface of the device, and then it measures the, the RNA from the virus or different sequences of RNA from the virus to then tell us, hopefully, whether the person, hopefully the person is negative, but if the person is positive, we get that information. Very, very low uh, amounts of material. Um, without the amplification cycle that we need, which we see in the quantitative polymerase chain reaction. And is that the, what well, we've seen occasionally, uh, pictures of uh, people in drive-in test areas where you can go along and it's more or less done on the spot? That will, that's the long-term goal. We're not there yet, but that is what we're aiming at. So because finding people or people knowing they're positive as, as quickly as possible is one of the keys to stopping the spread of the virus. Now for questions. If you could uh, give your background of, well, say where you're from, and uh, we will take the questions as they come in, and each one will be answered by one or perhaps two of our specialists. Who'd like to be first? Let's see, it's coming in. Let me just ask another question of Justin. Um, there was some suggestion in the news over the last couple of days about the traces of virus that might be there, even when someone seems to have recovered. Is that possibly the remnants of a kind of living virus? So that's a very difficult question, um, Robin, but I think that we have uh, certain challenges and one of them is actually to when we say something's there or not there what we're usually saying is actually we, it's below what we can detect and so more sensitive sensors will allow us to be able to detect things early but the main way we know whether somebody has actually had the virus or not well one of the ways and the, the common way we've done in the past is to detect um, antibodies that the body has, has produced as part of the natural defense mechanism to fight the virus. But um, I have a question actually, the, the, the one question as somebody who develops sensors that I would really like to know the answer, answer to is for the people working at the front line, for the clinicians, for the epidemiologists, what would be the perfect sensor for them? What would they really love to have? That's, that's the question that for us sensor developers we'd really like to know. Yeah, I have a view on most things, Justin, as you know. I think um, the, the idea would be to something that told us about live virus, uh, that told us how much live virus was there, and told us a bit about the um, way that that virus exists in, in terms of um, its genome or its mutations or something like that. One of the issues that I think in going forward with nanosensors is going to be, we're probably going to have a more sensitive detection. Just detecting something is, is great. And that's what we do with PCR and probably nanosensors will be uh, more sensitive. However, just because it's there as has been alluded to, doesn't necessarily mean it's infectious virus. It may be a bit of residual genome, a bit of residual RNA. And so uh, a nanosensor that was sensitive, quantitative, told us whether something was alive or dead, particularly in terms of viruses, and maybe gave us a bit of information about the virus itself genetically, would be the perfect sensor. Yeah. Bill, while you've got the floor, could you give us your presentation about the state of things as you see? Uh, yeah, happy to. <laughs> um, so uh, can you see my screen all right? 
or not yet. Sorry, I'll just share the screen. Uh, yep. And then you should be able to see my screen okay. Yep. Um, so look, uh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy, Robin, to give a brief introduction. It will be brief because I think um, everybody's seen a lot of um, data on the internet and uh, I would recommend that people stick with uh, well-known websites like the Commonwealth and state government websites, the CDC, the WHO, um, because really there is a lot of information out there. And so I won't dwell upon it except um, to go through a couple of very introductory um, issues that I think inform what we're going to talk about. Um, coronaviruses, the four shown here, NL63, 229E, OC43 and HKU1, have been known for a long time. Um, some of them, like HKU1 from Hong Kong, have been described more recently. And they cause about one in 10 or one in eight of colds, you know, stuffy nose, minor illness, very rarely cause pneumonia. But of course, really, they're very similar to rhinoviruses. And then we came to um, a number of other things that can cause pneumonia, which are shown here. And then what we saw was the emergence of SARS-1. Uh, that was in 2003. It was a very limited uh, infection. There are about a thousand cases globally and the, the mortality rate was quite high, particularly from pneumonia, and that was around about nine or 10 percent. We've also seen some other coronaviruses. So these are genetically related to these more common coronaviruses that we've known about for a long time. And that included MERS, which still circulates, but is predominantly an animal to to person spread. And of course, more recently, uh, since around November of last year, we saw emergence of uh, a virus called SARS coronavirus 2, um, which closely resembles viruses found in bats. And the disease due to SARS coronavirus 2 is COVID-19. This virus is so named because it's very closely related to SARS coronavirus 1, which is the virus we last saw in 2004. These are um, some data which in the rapidly changing world of, um, of COVID-19 are, are really sort of regarded as ancient and yet they were only published a couple of months ago. Uh, but these are some of the original data and I think um, it's very important to look at this because these were some of the original cases before um, a lot of what's happened subsequently. Um, these were cases predominantly initially uh, in Wuhan. Um, they were um, described and um, they were predominantly before January the 1st arising in individuals who had a close relationship with a particular part of Wuhan, which was a uh, seafood wholesale market or a type of wet market. Um, it was not only seafood, there are other animals sold there. There's been a lot of politics and discussion and everything around that. But when we originally heard about this, it was believed that the seafood market also had bats uh, not only living there, but also sold as um, for consumption. What's interesting and, and I think reflects um, some of the epidemiology that I'm sure others will talk about is that as you go later until the end of January, what you see is the number of cases associated with the seafood market as proportion becomes much smaller. So clearly there was um, spread, there was person to person spread and that was um, uh, eventually became global and as you're all aware now, involves um, uh, almost 5 million people. The other thing is that it was very interesting at the start, no healthcare workers were involved, but of course, uh, early on there were people contacting their healthcare worker and they were um, uh, in fact severely affected. And um, uh, uh, Lu Weng Liang uh, is one of the first people to diagnose uh, cases and in fact died from it. And there are a number of people, including ophthalmologists, probably because of close contact, uh, who sadly died in the initial outbreak. What then became uh, evident, as has become evidence, that spread to healthcare workers can occur. And of course, what we do is try and prevent that with our um, personal protective um, equipment. Um, these are some of the people in our lab, but there are clearly people in, in many other labs around the country and around the world who are working um, in this area. And, and this just reflects what we do now. What we do now is use commercial assays. We use very um, sophisticated assays on large throughput machines. 
but it's important to remember that when we did our first test on the 27th of February of this year, we were using tests that we developed on the basis of the genome that had been um, uh, published a few weeks before on the basis of our um, uh, really research and development and um, using an in-house assay. And I think what this speaks to is the importance of having a research capacity to back up routine diagnostics because it meant that many of us, um, including our lab, but other labs around the country, um, were able to early on provide diagnostics. Of course, now this is a map, these are maps from the CDC, um, but there are similar maps on the WHO and, and other sites. Um, and, and in blue, or this uh, colour is the um, countries who've reported cases of COVID-19, that is infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, and you can see there's very few countries that have not um, reported cases. And this is a, a heat map, if you like, um, the darker brown being countries where now large numbers of cases are occurring, um, and the yellow being cases where areas where large numbers of cases are, have not been reported in the last week. Uh, to date in Australia, there have been 7,000 um, confirmed cases, uh, of whom the majority have recovered. Um, and um, fortunately, small number of those who have died. Um, interesting, in New Zealand, um, proportionally smaller numbers, uh, slightly. Um, uh, I'm not sure how you can have more recovered cases and confirmed, but um, they've had about one and a half thousand cases. And a sim interestingly, uh, with a much smaller population, a similar proportion though of deaths. And so Australia really so far has been quite fortunate. Um, as a virologist, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the virus, although that does occupy a lot of our time. Um, uh, the viruses that we see, the coronaviruses, uh, including the ones that cause mild illness, um, often come from bats. And we believe that, that these are bat viruses that either come through a, um, uh, if you like, a modulating host. Um, in the case of SARS-1, this was a civet cat, um, which is a, a type of animal that in some of these wet markets are um, uh, sadly eaten by people. Um, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, it's definitely not snakes. Uh, there was a publication on that. Um, we think that it may be possible that SARS-CoV-2 is directly transmitted from bats to humans and that there is some other intervening host which may also modulate it. Uh, this, this is really a, um, a genetic tree and what it shows is that the SARS-CoV viruses that are infecting humans are clustering with those that infect bats. And so at a genetic level, they're clustering and unsurprisingly, they can then infect humans. Um, if you look, uh, I won't go into detail about the, the genome, but we had the genome very early on. Um, the research groups in China did a very good job of, um, uh, of sequencing this very quickly. Um, the sequence was provided a couple of weeks later to the international community, and that allowed us to develop in-house tests not only in Australia, but clearly elsewhere, and um, allowed us to get a start, if you like, on diagnosis. And of course, diagnosis is essential to describing a disease, to describing the epidemiology, to describing transmission. And so being able to diagnose early for Australia was really important. Um, we have one lab, but we're one of many. And I, I would emphasize that, although I'll talk about our experience, this is reflected at other labs throughout the state and around the country. And um, this is our team, uh, inappropriately socially distanced, but I can tell you they were holding their breath uh, for a photo. We started um, testing uh, in February. Um, we utilised a standard PCR test and there'll be a lot of discussion about uh, more sensitive tests than this and, and, and tests using um, nanoparticles. We started with in-house assays. We had a lot of help from Hong Kong University um, we had a lot of help from our colleagues at Westmead um, and we had a lot of help from overseas laboratories and eventually um, over the, the following month or six weeks we moved to commercial platforms. There are a number. Um, we use these platforms shown here um, but uh, they're really now quite reliable. We are testing them um, more closely because as you might imagine these were introduced very quickly. Um, there are continuing issues with um, uh, trying to keep ahead of reagent shortages. Um, 
equipment does fail and the mean time between failures does uh, reduce as you use equipment more. Staff do become unwell and um, uh, we have plans as do others where staff are into two teams so that if one person acquires um, COVID-19 then the other team takes over and again we do that with um, uh, other teams, with other laboratories rather. We think that um, it's absolutely essential to um, have a, um, a process of research associated with this, not only clinical research and epidemiological research in, co in collaboration with public health, but also uh, with basic science and improving um, diagnostics and um, the ability to sense um, a molecule and after all a virus is just a piece of RNA molecule and doing that for a patient at their bedside and in a way that they can read it is absolutely essential. It, it would take me out of the equation and I'd be perfectly happy with that. It would mean that um, we would have a rapid accurate test that people could use. Um, serology is very important. There's been a lot in the press about antibody detection. We now have commercial assays that we and others are assessing and um, in the laboratory they're working very well. But what they are is to detect previous infection they're not used so useful in um, recent infection. And a lot of the bad press around serology has been because it's been used inappropriately. Um, there's a lot of other studies. I've just listed a couple of those there, but it's very important in my view that these are done in a collaborative way. And that's, that's been one of the remarkable things about this is the level of collaboration. And so um, uh, a quote I've used before, but I'll use again um, from Fred Sanger, who of course is one of the a handful of people who've had the Nobel Prize twice, but um, he made the point um, in 1980, so you know, 40 years ago, that we can make a permanent contribution towards improvement, enriching human life, and it's that those pursuits that we and he, he included himself at the time when he had um, already received his second Nobel Prize. Uh, he included himself as a student who worked in this area. So we're learning a lot about this, and um, we are continuing to. We're probably about um, two thirds of the way through, but there's a lot of development to do. And it's, it's the research and development between basic groups and, and clinical groups that's really gonna take us forward to the next step. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, Fred Sanger, one of the most modest people with uh, such achievements. One quick question, if I may, Bill. Um, there seem to be far more men seriously affected than women. Any theories apart from perhaps someone suggested because men smoke more, why that might be happening? Well, it's interesting. Um, the comment about smoking is interesting because there were some data that suggested smoking was protective, which yeah. made it very hard to talk to our patients. <laughs> um, it's also made it very hard, of course, to talk to people with um, obsessive compulsive disorder when hand washing, um, they've been telling me that they've been doing that for years and um, they were clearly on the right track. It's, it's not clear to me, and, and maybe it's a question for the epidemiologists, um, why the um, why men are more affected? There's been a lot of discussion around, you know, social issues around um, approaches to uh, hand washing and those kind of things. Um, there is some. Th there's no clear genetic data that I've seen that suggests men are at, at high risk. Um, my interpretation has been based around epidemiology and reasons around, um, you know, personal habits, if you like. Tanya, you have a comment. Uh I was not quite going to address this particular question about males, but I think Bill has really brought up the arguments that we can reasonably prosecute at the moment. Uh, in some countries, it's possible, I suppose, that some of the underlying diseases that are associated uh, with smoking are more likely to occur in males, but I won't take that comment further at the moment. My original um, framing was really around the question you posed about what would be the perfect sensor. And I think Bill has addressed that uh, very eloquently, but I just wanted to reframe it as a clinician's point of view. What we really need is a test that tells us quickly, as he's articulated, the diagnosis and preferably on the spot. We then need to know how long a patient remains infectious. And that's where he was talking about the live virus versus the non-live virus. But it's also possible that with a very low level of virus, 
you may not actually be infectious. So it would be nice to have a sensor that can give us a quantitative, if you like, correlation between the level of the virus that's alive and the likelihood of transmission of infection. And then, then of course, the antibody side of things, it's important for us to be able to track infection in the community, uh, pick up cases who've clearly been asymptomatic but have contacted and become infected by the virus and see whether we need to do some urgent tracking around those particular individuals. Now, our first question. In fact, I'll ask Ben to handle this one. It comes from Tom, who's in Sydney, and asks, how do thermal sensors work and how accurate are they? Ben. Yeah, that's a good question. So thermal sensors, the types of thermal sensors that we're familiar with when we travel overseas in airports are based on infrared cameras. So these are cameras that observe the world around them in the infrared and the infrared um, reveals temperature. And that's a reasonably accurate way of remotely assessing the temperature if you focus on the face. Um, I, I think others might comment on the accuracy in terms of the current context. My understanding is that certainly within half a degree Celsius, they're kind of ballpark accuracy, but I can see Mary Louise probably has a more confident comment on that matter. So I'll pass over to Mary Louise. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, look, during SARS, um, I was an advisor to one of the hospitals and um, also in Macau. And of course, going through those sensors, I mean, they've improved since 2002, 2003. But uh, there was a classic uh, story of a patient in China who knew he had SARS, wanted to get home um, to uh, Hong Kong, Macau area, and so took a paracetamol to lower his temperature so he wouldn't be picked up. So that's one of the problems. And of course, uh, for some reason, um, of, you know, patients or humans like to be home uh, yeah. when they're unwell. Uh, so, so that is a problem. Also during um, the COVID-19, uh, we've looked at um, the uh, eliciting a temperature and there, and we've actually just published recently a paper on asymptomatics. And we've estimated that about 16% of people may be uh, asymptomatic. Now that may just be for seven days. Uh, they may only be asymptomatic for a protracted period and then become uh, symptomatic eventually, but they don't listen to te a temperature. And uh, during Iceland and uh, the homeless in the US, when they did population uh, testing, they actually found a very low number in the population elicit a temperature. And even those that are uh, patients that go and get tested uh, for COVID-19, often uh, maybe half elicit a temperature. So it it sends more of a signal, pub, a public health signal. We're taking this seriously. We're going to take your temperature. We expect you to hand hygiene as you enter uh, the building and as you leave it. Um, but as for uh, it being a good uh, surveillance system, I think it's more of a great public health um, a messaging system. And, and uh, just um, hooking on to what Tanya and, um, and Bill have mentioned about what epidemiologists look for in, uh, in surveillance. So um, I've um, developed surveillance myself and also been a WHO advisor on surveillance. And, and what we look for uh, apart from is it, uh, is it reasonably inexpensive so it can be equitably used around the world? Um, is it, uh, can it be a rapid uh, surveillance system? Uh, do, is it fairly non-invasive to patients? Do patients understand what they're agreeing to? Uh, but also, uh, does it um, uh, not identify you as falsely negative? So I think uh, Tanya and Bill uh, were uh, alluding to this. Uh, we call it positive or negative predictive value. And it can be a very difficult to get a good uh, positive predictive value or good negative predictive value when uh, the prevalence is low in the community. So you may rule out people as not being uh, infected where in fact they are. So Tanya's um, point about, well, you may have 
uh, some antibodies, but are you really a problem to the community? That's a very important question um, that the rest of the panel uh, experts who are developing these things need to think because it is a great um, question that Tanya has brought up. Um, thank you, over. Thank you. Next question is actually from uh, Nicole in Chicago, Illinois, quite up late. What will it take for the sensor technology Professor Gooding describes to become broadly available and usable for testing novel viruses like COVID-19? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, um, that's quite a long, it's quite a lot of things that it needs to be able to do. First, we need to know, we need to always benchmark benchmark the technology to quantitative PCR because that's currently the gold standard and that's the system that we trust. We then need to be able to make it, uh, ensure that the technology is, can be reliably manufactured, can be uh, with the, and that the reagents are broadly available. So basically we need to make sure it gives the right answer and that everybody can use it. And I thought the point Mary Louise made there about the technology being cheap enough so it can equitably, equitably be used around the world is actually a really important question. The economics of sensors is actually something that we, we haven't thought about or talked about much in this country or even around the world is that we could have had a lot of these sensors already if people were willing to bring them to market. Um, we don't have them because there wasn't, didn't seem to be an economic imperative. Um, and so these are, these are also very important issues. But in the case of our sensor, it's very, very promising so far. Uh, it's really agreeing very, very well with quantitative PCR. We've got to learn how to make it more and more reliably so that anybody could use it. We can get it to work in the lab, but that journey to get it to be work, working by anybody is one of the toughest challenges in developing any technology. And is this a versatile technology that can be used for other purposes as well? Yes, that, that's actually one of the, the, the secrets of it is that um, we can change. So the way we detect the viral RNA is that we have a sequence of DNA on our nanoparticles that matches the viral RNA sequence. Hmm. Uh, and so we can change that sequence of DNA um, and then we can detect a different virus. So um, with the work we did with Bill, we, we, we mostly focused on H1N1, but we're now obviously pivoting to show the same technology can be used for COVID-19. And so once the technology can be made really robustly and used by everybody, then it's just a simple matter of a new virus comes along, we change the sequence, we do the validation of the, of the performance of the sensor and we're ready to go. So that's really the goal that we're aiming for. The future, yes. Next question we'll ask for CN to have a look at a question from Susan in Melbourne. As the inflammation from COVID pneumonia starts, it causes the air sacs to collapse and oxygen levels fall, yet the lungs initially remain compliant, not yet stiff or heavy with fluid. This means patients can still expel carbon dioxide and without a buildup of carbon dioxide, patients do not feel short of breath. Is this correct? CM. Thanks, Robin. Uh, thank you, Susan. Susan asks a really interesting question, um, uh, and, and it's fascinating. In patients with severe COVID-19 related pneumonia, that, that this has been observed uh, quite consistently across the world, actually, that patients might be, have severe pneumonia and be severely hypoxic, i.e. have low oxygen levels in their blood, and yet be minimally symptomatic in terms of their breathlessness. And I, I don't think anyone truly understands the phenomenon because pathologically from a lung point of view, I'm, I'm not sure it's all that different to, to other viral pneumonitis and maybe Bill can comment on that. But- I have to ask you, isn't there a suggestion in, that it's something to do with capillaries and the vascular system? I'm not sure if it is. I think the, the, there are lots of theories around at the moment. I'm not sure anyone truly understands it. And mm -hmm. maybe it has, uh, it's been theorized that maybe the virus has some sort of effect on the, on the brainstem respiratory uh, centers. And, and um, because she's right that carbon dioxide is the main driver, but so are low oxygen levels in terms of this sensation mm -hmm. that you feel breathless. Um, so for whatever reason, it, particularly in COVID-19 patients, this has been seen consistently that, that they're, they're turning up with oxygen saturations levels that are very low and yet they're not very symptomatic. And I guess that's the rationale for us trying to develop this system where we're measuring O2 sats in the community 
because hopefully we're detecting deteriorating patients before they even realize they're deteriorating. Bill, did you want to comment? Yeah, look, I think um, the, the best comment I can make is it's something we're still learning about. Um, the, the lack of um, discomfort with these high levels and, and this hypoxia is, is quite different. And in other settings with viral illness, such as with enteroviruses, um, uh, as Sian said, we, we have seen uh, neurogenic pulmonary edema. So uh, infection of the brainstem, for example, with enterovirus 71 results in very uh, significant um, pulmonary edema, and yet you don't find much virus in the lungs. So clearly um, with SARS-CoV-2, we are seeing um, some neurological syndromes, uh, which it clearly does uh, involve the brain spinal cord so it is possible that that's one component and secondly uh, if you are involving the brainstem it is quite possible that you could um, if you like reset your regulation or, or your sensation in relation to hypoxia and that that could be part of it but that is speculation because again we haven't seen a lot of that and we haven't actually seen a lot of, um, uh, of histological or, or post-mortem uh, information about what's going on in the brains of these patients. I guess my final comment is uh, it's not quite as clear as we saw, for example, with um, influenza, with the Spanish flu, where cytokine storm was an issue. But one interesting thing about that is that the influenza virus that caused that, that caused massive inflammation of the lung, massive flu overload and death, was a virus that really was very much a bird virus, not a human adapted virus. Now, if this is is as as I am thinking more and more with the data, is a very bat, closely related to bat virus, not so much an adapted virus, then that kind of effect may well be because it is a, a sort of direct zoonosis rather than an adaptation virus. And that, that may mean that what we're seeing is, uh, are some very unusual effects and, and that's why it's been hard to sort out. Fascinating, thank you very much, Bill. Next question from Alfredo Martinez Cole. And this is open to anyone. He's, by the way, uh, Alfredo is from UTS, the University of Technology in Sydney. Question is for rapid testing. Any chance a test can be developed to provide info on the stage of infection? What will be required? What is involved in doing that? So who would like to uh, tackle that one? The stage of infection. I'm happy to have a go. Bill. <laughs> I guess what we do at the moment, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, what we do at the moment is use different types of tests. So we use serology alongside um, molecular tests, along PCR testing, uh, alongside quantitative testing. So we use multiple things to inform that. So if somebody, for example, doesn't have, have raised antibodies, but they do are positive on PCR, we know that they're early. So perhaps a sensing assay where we had uh, multiple sensors that were measured at the same time, uh, perhaps an assay that measured what we call uh, IgG avidity, which is how um, old the antibody is. Is the antibody within the last couple of months or is the antibody more than three months ago? If you could measure those things alongside detection of infection, you could come up with a platform that said, um, this is more likely to be recent, uh, very recent or old. And in other settings, uh, in other viral settings, such as with cytomegalovirus, we do measure IgG avidity because what that measures is whether an antibody has been circulating in the body for a long time and has, if you like, moulded more towards the, um, towards the virus. It takes a little while to mould, and when it, when it more closely moulds and more closely recognises, we call that more highly avid, and that occurs after about three months. So there are ways of doing it, but it might involve multiple tests done at the same time. Any, uh, anyone else want to add? Uh, it's Tanya here. I'd, I'd quite like to address that as well. And one of the things to consider with the stages of disease are the early phase, the sort of second week phase, where people sometimes seem to get worse, having done quite well in the first week. And then those that progress to really severe disease. 
And our thinking is that there are different components to that and that within the first and sort of second week phases, it's more related to the virus itself, but in the very severely ill, it's clearly a massive host response. And so another set of parameters that we can look at are really host response or biomarkers that are produced by the infected individual uh, in response to the infection. And one of the reasons for researchers being very keen to look at various components of the host response, not only in terms of whether it makes patients generate immunity to subsequent infection, but also to tell us how severe the infection is likely to be and what trajectory it's likely to take. And so there are a number of uh, genetic markers that people are identifying and testing to see whether or not, A, it will determine the severity of infection to start with, and B, whether you can actually predict or prognosticate about the trajectory of infection, whether patients need to be triaged very quickly to an intensive care or critical care situation because they're likely to get worse rapidly, or whether in fact they can go home. <laughs> Thank you. Next question from Judith Dawes is in photonics. What kinds of sensing tests are needed and what level of sensitivity is needed? Ben. Can't quite hear. We can't quite hear you. I think you're muted. Damn it, sorry. Ah, there you are. I was just saying that I might throw that specific question in terms of sensitivity to Justin or Mary Louise, but I might steer that conversation or that question in a slightly different direction and see if this is resonating with the panel. So far, we've talked about sensors that detect the virus, the antibodies. I'm interested in a conversation that asks the question, are there sensors that can inform someone when they need to be tested? So at the moment, we're in a regime where Justin's got this fantastic new technology. There are companies that are claiming to have point of care devices. Uh, we are testing at a high rate. But I guess, how do we get to a point where we have that confidence that when someone is feeling unwell, they do go and get tested? Are there sensors that in the home by monitoring the biorhythm, sleep pattern, um, listening to someone snoring, uh, wearables, uh, thermal sensors at home, devices in the home. And I guess to extrapolate from that perspective, because there's certainly a lot of technology out there um, and that's where data fusion AI has a role. How do we bring that into the hospital? How do we help the ICU doctor know when someone needs to be taken into the ICU using that sensor fusion? So I guess I might sort of steer the conversation in that direction. And I think back to Judith's comment, obviously from a photonics point of view, there's a lot that photonics can bring in terms of those types of sensors. But maybe I throw that back to the panel and I throw that to Mary Louise, Tanya, Bill for a perspective on that sort of pre-testing. How, how do we inform someone that they need to be tested? Mary Louise, why don't you take off? Okay, so... May I first um, add to Tanya's point about the biomarkers and uh, trying to understand how sick the patient may uh, eventually, uh, you know, go on to developing a severe infection. So we've noticed from early uh, in China that if patients didn't start getting better by about day 10, um, and if they didn't get admitted to hospital, at about day 12, they were admitted to ICU and they were very ill and it increased their likelihood of death. So to have uh, a test that could give you an idea um, uh, not you know about how badly you're going to respond to the virus uh, would be fantastic because from an epidemiological point of view, you don't have to wait and keep people at home being cared for at home thinking they're having a mild case. Um, or in China, they eventually um, built a purpose-built uh, building for them. Uh, so I, I think um, building on, on that idea, I think is, is fantastic. Um, as for the sensors um, and epidemiologically, 
Um, yeah, I'll just pick up on one thing um, that uh, that uh, Benjamin mentioned about snoring. Um, we have about 16% of people who are asymptomatic or they don't report symptoms because they don't identify unusual symptoms or mild symptoms. And we know that kids are getting unusual symptoms because they have uh, a rapid uh, immune response to their upper airways and they can start doing things like having a, a snoring sound when they're not actually asleep. So how do you get the public to identify uh, when children should be tested or even when supposedly asymptomatic people should be tested and it's a very good uh, question but it's a very difficult one uh, certainly um, the COVID safe app is supposed to try to help to uh, cascade um, a response to get people into being tested but there's one big problem from an epidemiological surveillance person's point of view and that is if you're asymptomatic or refusing to identify you, you could be ill and you take too long to get tested, then you've effectively uh, potentially uh, infected others uh, until you get tested or until one of your contacts gets sick and they get tested. So I think uh, a sensor of breath or, you know, they're talking about training dogs or, um, you know, one of those that is not invasive, that is uh, has reasonable uh, predictiveness, even if it rules in too many uh, false positives to, to then go on to getting tested, it, it would be a great idea uh, from an epidemiological perspective. Over. Thank you. Anyone? Else? This is Wojtek. If I could add to this conversation, uh, we actually have the technology which allows to listen the physiological responses of our body, especially in the upper and the lower respiratory tract. And this is the technology which is available. It is very much a blanket or the yoga mat on which you can sleep. And it's relatively sensitive. And I think it can be very helpful to add to all the sensors which we have, which are zero one sensors, which are showing, yes, there is a viral infection there is a response of the body. While this one is more physiological, which can add a lot of value to the severity of the infection and exactly what Tanya mentioned, whether the patients should be triaged to the ICU or some other treatments can be done. So we have technology and I think there is a lot of opportunity to look on combination what Ben mentioned at the very beginning, multiple types of the sensors which are looking on the physiological responses of the body and we say unsymptomatic patients. Asymptomatic is, this is how our brain was trained. We don't feel it as the something which happens in our body, but most likely if we have something very sensitive, which can look into the blood flow. And we know now that the blood flow is changing because of the clotic formation with the, with the viral infections. If we can look maybe on these responses of the upper and the respiratory system and combining this with the detection of the virus antibodies, this could be a very powerful technique. But I would add to this that once we have this, we also should use them along the side with the technologies which can actually treat the viral infections and the conditions and monitor whether the treatments which we have are effective or not. So it's not only detecting whether we have the virus, but whether the health is deteriorating or we are recovering from the, from the disease and how we can align the different types of the treatments which we have uh, available. Tanya, do you want to add to that? Yes, look, I think it's a really interesting question and I would frame it around uh, particular settings in which this could be complementary. So one of them would be in someone in a household who has the infection and you may wish to monitor their health, but actually having their close contacts have some additional technology available that might indicate that they are becoming infected. So that might be one uh, indication where measuring oxygen or other physiological parameters could be particularly valuable. The other setting that uh, really goes back to the initial question about temperature monitoring might be in high risk settings. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, at the moment, for example, people who work in hospitals or who are entering hospitals 
are asked to undergo a te temperature check and to answer a series of questions. One option might be in those higher risk settings to link some of these physiological measurements uh, to a temperature measurement and perhaps automate a series of questions that can actually mean that there don't have to be a set of nurses or other uh, highly trained individuals actually standing at the entrance to the healthcare facility when they should be perhaps better deployed looking after patients. So the, the point that I'm making, I guess, is that is horses for courses. There would be very important settings where these would be extremely beneficial. To have it as a, a diagnostic in the general community, I think that's a bigger ask. Thank you very much indeed. Well, back to Wojciech, because we have a question from Ben Wright in Sydney, who asks, where are the groundbreaking innovations occurring in diagnostic sensing rather than evolutionary changes? Back to Newcastle. Well, I guess this is the question, I, I guess, to the whole group. But I, I would say it's a combination. It's not a, you know, taking the single point testing and saying yes, no, but it's actually taking multiple sensors and integrating them. So this is what Ben alluded at the very beginning, when you have the integration of the sensors and something which we could, you know, translate into the virtual hospital at home when, they, when the people can actually diagnose themselves. Uh, and I think this would be something extremely important, but I would also go back to sensors which can be applied in the public spaces. I'm a customer of the public trains or the Sydney trains, and I would love to be informed when there is an infection which is spreading or the, the virus which is spreading in an environment. Obviously, there has to be the contamination process in place as well, but you know, we talk about the patients, but these patients will gain this infection somehow. So if this, you know, high condensation, you know, public spaces can be also sensed and we can sense whether there is a possibility for the virus, it would be absolutely fantastic. But, but the revolution definitely is something around the sensitivity, what Justin uh, alluded to. Sensitivity is a critical bit. And how we make sure that what we are sensing is exactly what, what we want to sense, sensitivity, and their life, or whether the virus is live and still active. Well, anyone else want to add to that? The evolution. Yeah, I would like to add to that, Robin. Innovation. Yes, Justin. Yeah, I think Watchex made a really important point there, which has thread been a thread from a number of other other discussions. We don't need. There's not just a one size fits all sensor. We need different layers of technologies, things that give really quick responses to things that give really really accurate responses, and everything in between. And that's where the sensor fusion idea of what um, Ben was talking about is also becomes really important. How do you take those different bits of information to tell, give one coherent story? But the one thing I wanted to, well, two things I wanted to refer back to, one was what Wojciech said about sensitivity. That's, that's where the groundbreaking um, in revolutionary steps forward come, but also about um, selectivity, because if a, if a sensor is 99.9% .9 uh, accurate, but we actually only have one in a million people getting with, with the, the disease, then it actually stands up not being all that useful. So prevalence of the disease really changes what the sensor needs to do. The other thing I wanted to refer to was actually about earlier on about asymptomatic people and how we could um, pick up people that haven't wanted to go testing. Well, well, it's well known in sensing in the sensing area and motion measurement areas that if we have acute symptoms, we're willing to pay a lot of money and go and get tested very quickly. If we don't have any symptoms, it's really hard to get us to do that. And the way you do that is actually build the sensors into everyday lives. So uh, if I have to do something and I've got no symptoms, I probably won't. But if something I do in everyday life, like go to the toilet, reports back that I've got a problem, then that sort of technology is becomes very, very useful. So one of the things as sensor developers we need to do is also not just focus on what the sensor can do, but how we can integrate it in, into lives in a seamless way so that the user um, is report, getting the information they need without having to do anything special. Indeed. Now is a very big question we've had in the media quite a lot recently, and uh, it'll be something that uh, Paul Dastour might like to have a look at, and that is the antibodies and how much they convey 
some sort of immunity and how long they last. And uh, is there any knowledge about that kind of effect and how long it lasts? Paul. Um, I'm afraid that's something that, that I don't know anything about in terms of uh, immunity and antibody detection. I mean, clearly what we need to do is to be doing much more testing in order to be able to make these correlations. And I think this talks to this, this ongoing discussion we've had this morning around selectivity, around how can we tell where we're up to in the stage of the disease? How can we tell whether you're recovered or not recovered? What that's really talking to is the need to increase even further the amount of testing that we're doing. And to do that, I think we really have to come up with ways in which that testing can be far less invasive even than it is now. We know, for example, that uh, the virus is expressed in saliva. And so one of the things that we're doing here is looking at developing tests based on sampling saliva, which will make it much easier to do many, many more tests. I mean, at the moment we're, we're testing and you get a response in 48 hours um, and so on. We really need to be testing you know, on an hourly basis uh, or with a, with a turnaround time in hours and with uh, the ability to do that at point of care or even perhaps even at, in, in the home. Um, that's going to require the ability for that test to be much less invasive uh, and those barriers that Justin was talking about, about people not wanting to be tested. Right? It's okay to be tested once with um, you know, the, the um, stick up your nose, but a few times and it becomes really, really uncomfortable. Um, and that then leads to the fact that if you're going to do this, the other thing we do have to focus on is developing tests that can be manufactured massively at scale. Hmm. What about those antibodies? There has been speculation in the press and elsewhere that uh, people could pass on their acquired immunity. In other words, they could take the antibodies and pass them on to somebody else. Anyone working on that at the moment? So I might talk about uh, use of what we call IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin as a therapeutic. Uh, it has a long history and um, recently the ARCBS lifeblood have begun collecting uh, blood from donors and that'll be tested for uh, immunoglobulin as it is overseas and um, some of that will be concentrated for hyperimmune globulin to be used in therapeutics. Uh, there's clearly a lot of uh, interest in this because it's a natural immunity but in the case of this respiratory virus as with a number of other respiratory viruses the amount of antibody developed how long it is whether it's what we call neutralizing, that is it kills virus, um, and um, uh, whether it's effective uh, are still open questions. So there has been work done overseas. Um, we and others did work in other viral infections where it does seem to improve. I mentioned enteroviruses before, that does seem to make an improvement in the outcome for children. But in this setting, even though it seems logical that it might help, there is, of course, a lot of concern. You actually need to do the studies. Um, there may be unexpected side effects, such as thing, uh, something called antibody-dependent enhancement that I think you would all know about, where we think that maybe if you've had antibody circulating and you get another virus infection with a similar strain, you may actually do worse. So even though it sounds uh, logical, there needs to be a lot of research around it and that that is being done at the moment it's really being led by um, the blood transfusion service lifeblood while we've got you bill michael story from sydney asks what field-based covid detection technologies are available for use by operational staff is there any dipstick style technology uh, there are dipstick style technologies, um, although they've mainly been around um, lateral flow antibody testing. That's like a pregnancy test. And for acute infection, that's proven really ineffective as a diagnostic and misleading. There are um, uh, molecular based testing platforms which you can use in the field. Uh, they're particularly often around um, military developments and they get dropped out of helicopters and um, airplanes and they're very robust and they're very accurate um, they're very expensive uh, and they work within about an hour but typically what we see with those kind of platforms is you do need a skilled operator because even though they're relatively simple 
Um, the operator doesn't necessarily have to be scientifically or medically trained, uh, but they have to do it over and over. If you just pick it up and do it, you don't do as well. And so it's not, if you like, as robust in the hands of uh, people. There are antigen tests being developed, although again, a lot of those at the moment are not sensitive enough. And if you get a negative result, you don't know. If you get a positive result, they tend to be informative. So they're quite specific, but they aren't detecting all of them. And clearly this is, this is why we, to some extent, this is why we're talking. This is just the platform for a, um, uh, a, a sensor or a nanoparticle sensing platform that you could use on a smartphone. And, and that's the gap that we're all trying to fill. Thank you very much, Bill. Next question, um, I'm going to ask CN, but other people can come in. Jamie Stanistreet from Sydney. I believe there is work going on utilizing sensors connected to mobile phones to identify certain health conditions. Are the panel aware of this? CN first. Uh, so yes, there's been lots of work um, in this area. We, we've been doing some work with uh, in cardiac patients. So we use a Bluetooth enabled uh, weight scales, blood pressure monitor, uh, wearable activity monitors for COVID uh, and eximeter. But there are many other um, peripheral devices with sensors that, that you can pair to your mobile phone. Um, certainly UNSW, they've been working uh, with peak flow meters, spirometers, glucometers, um, smart socks for patients with Parkinson's disease, um, sensors that can uh, assess your gait and uh, assess when you fall. So there are a lot of sensors out there and, and um, I don't think the availability of sensors is the issue that the, I guess the, the rate limiting steps have been um, having a good workflow so it works clinically. So engaging clinicians and co-designing uh, systems that, that work for clinicians. Uh, the Having a back end, which we thankfully have, which has data analytics involved so that you can monitor large numbers of populations with very small clinical team, um, which makes it cost efficient uh, and effective. And, and most importantly, the, the cost of the peripheral devices. So the eximeter that we're using for our COVID patients costs $6.50 US. So that, that's what makes it implementable in the end and scalable. Remarkable. And how does smart socks work? Uh, that's not my area of expertise, but my understanding is it gives feedback to Parkinsonian patients so that they keep walking. Because as you know, if they slow down their gait, then, then they, they can kind of get stuck. So that's work that Matthew Brody, Kim Bill Bear, Nigel Lovell have been doing with some funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Really interesting stuff. Interesting. Out of my area of expertise. Justin. Yeah, the smart socks work by measuring pressure and the pressure on the gates and then communicating back to the mobile phone. And I think this is one of the points about the communicating back to the phone that, that's a really important point in sense of development. Some people have tried to use the phone itself as part of the sensor. And though that can be incredibly effective, the challenge with it is that, as you all know, our mobile phone changes every year and all the different componentry changes every year. And so that actually starts to make it, means that you know, you've got your sensor developed and the mobile phone company's already moved on to the three phones later. But the communicating to the phone and then communicating the information, um, that is where the real, the real power is of the phone in terms of sensing um, these sorts of things, uh, yeah. just because the phones change too quickly. And CN has already mentioned, you know, six bucks for some device. Well, it's amazing. Elizabeth in Sydney asks, we're hearing in this forum about various sensing solutions, but how can we make an affordable wearable sensor? Paul, you got an opinion on that? Yeah, I think that, um, that we do have now pathways to doing that. The advent of uh, printable electronics gives us a pathway now to fabricate electronic devices on stretchable, uh, flexible substrates. Um, that's what we do here at the University of Newcastle. And so we now are able to look at integrating these sorts of sensor technologies directly into electronics that we can print at extraordinarily low cost. So, you know, the sorts of costs that we're looking at when you're manufacturing at scale are less than a cent per sensor. Of course, that doesn't take into account the interfacing and the other 
um, electronics that Justin was talking about. But certainly from that point of view, we can see really uh, accessible pathways to large scale, low cost, rapid manufacturing. Anyone else? Maybe I'll just add to this that probably integration of the technology is something which is definitely feasible. But, but the problem here at this stage will be validation, how to validate them and how to make sure that the readings which we have and the outputs which they are providing are exactly the one which we would like to see. So the integration with the uh, machine learning, large data analysis, and a lot of validation, a lot of patients measure, it would be a critical part here. Yeah, not only the validation of the actual measurement, but also the validation of, of uh, the intervention, right? So even though we're measuring oxygen levels in patients in the community, what we don't know definitely is that if we can do so, whether or not we're actually able to reliably pick up those people who are getting sick and also intervene on them so that it, we have a positive outcome. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Paul, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with, with Wojtek. And I think that one of the things that's quite exciting in terms of what we've seen during this pandemic is how rapidly uh, we have been able to implement solutions, even up to large scale manufacturing across a range of technologies, whether that's PPE or sensors. So it's as if now we have broken down some of those development barriers and we're seeing very rapidly accelerating development. And that, of course, then plays to what uh, Siren was saying, that if we're able to now uh, create really large numbers of sensors, we can do really large statistical analysis on how effective they are both at detecting, but also in terms of clinical outcomes. Now a question to Bill Elegant, <laughs> sorry, Bill uh, from the University of Sydney, from Stefano Palumbo. What would be the ideal sensor? Is it fair to say that the holy grail would be to have a sensor that can be detected if the virus is present in the breath such as the virus breathalyzer, would this include also all the infected people, i.e. symptomatic and asymptomatic? Bill. I, I guess when we look at diagnosis, uh, we think of it in terms of several steps. And uh, we've discussed this before about the different aspects of the diagnosis, but taking a step back into specimen collection, several people have um, mentioned about the discomfort of uh, somebody putting a stick down your nose. Um, and uh, that may come from some personal experience because uh, many of us have had testing recently. And um, so clearly something that was using a highly um, available um, specimen and still producing a, uh, as accurate, sensitive and specific result will be ideal. A lot of us here have actually worked on um, exhaled breath condensate, for example, as a specimen. Um, we've worked um, uh, with the Woolcock Institute, uh, particularly with you and Toby, on sampling using that uh, in children, for example, where um, that may be. Um, it's clearly doable if you have the resources and an appropriate test platform. Um, we've all, well, many of us have had had breath tests on the side of the road and you simply count and that's then collected. That adapted to a either virus detection platform or a platform which detected um, responses, if you like, to the virus. So profiling of the host response, which may be better in that setting, would be ideal. And the problem has really been a practical one. Um, we can do that, we can collect condensate, we can show viruses there. Um, with Mary Lou and some other students, we did look at collecting, for example, in, in what's called an Anderson sample and looking at aerosol versus droplet and size particles. You can detect it, but you've got to be able to detect it. And this is the next step, it comes to your technology. And this is where the sensors may well come in because um, we can certainly detect it. We detect rhinovirus, for example, all the time. So we can tell you if you've got a cold, that's not a terribly useful thing to do because you can probably tell me better. But we know that we can do that. It's just that next step, that's technology step, where we're not sensitive enough. And then perhaps the third step that we've all been talking about, detecting live virus, detecting quantity of virus, detecting the genome of the virus um, to look at mutations. That's the third holy grail. So there's several steps to that. 
And certainly it's a very important question, but it's one of, as I see it, probably about four steps. Next question actually to Subhas. It comes from Denise Misser, who is in Sydney. Indicator sensors for hotspots in regards to early indication systems. Is there any progress in the creation of a sensor technology that could be deployed in wastewater effluent that would allow us to track hot spots? Subhas. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, it of course opens up the opportunity, but there are lots of challenges here. One of the biggest problem is to collect the samples. Uh, we can actually install the sensor in different places where we would like to test the hot spot. But one of the problem of this sensor is that how actually we ensure the sensor will continue to test and give good result because that waste, wastewater or other things, so they're very toxic and the sensor need to be very robust and the life, life, lifetime of the sensor is, is, is a challenging problem. But this is an interesting area and the, we researcher can look into that to develop robust and sensitive sensor for this application. Anyone else want to add to that? Ben, you look interested? I don't know why I would look interested in that particular topic. I won't dive into that. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, no, I think, Subhas, that makes an interesting point that I hadn't registered with the robustness of the sensor, a very practical issue that indeed that it's toxic. Um, but I certainly recognise that's part of the solution and part of uh, the portfolio of sensors that's needed, but I don't have anything to add beyond that. Reminds me of one of the pioneers of epidemiology, John Snow, with the old pump and the water supply. Very interesting. Question 12, well, it's actually from Susan Pond, Pond sorry. Children, kids schools in the New South Wales and other states are opening again, as we know. What tests can or should be deployed in schools to ascertain if children are or are not spreading the virus? What is the panel's view about returning to school? Who would like to tackle that big one? I'll, I'll start first. Um, no just, just from a purely epidemiological uh, point of view. Um, but just getting back to the wastewater one. Um, so I've been doing some wastewater testing for uh, antimicrobial resistant pathogens and working with a team trying to develop methodologies for testing COVID in wastewater. Uh, one of the difficulties is that, of course, we can test for the RNA, but it may not be um, an, a new infection. It could be an old infection. So there are challenges. Um, but as for the epidemiology of children in school, so um, I think we in Australia have about 4% of children um, that represent cases. So not a lot. Um, mostly the epidemiology comes from China. And children do get COVID-19, um, but they are more at risk of acquiring it in uh, very um, uh, enclosed areas from uh, family clusters. And so China learned quickly that when they were keeping people at home, uh, that this could happen. So they have built um, a facility for mild cases to remove family members uh, to prevent clusters in families. So the kids are more likely to catch it from their families, so that close um, uh, um, contact. And uh, Bill and I have talked about this before at, at other uh, venues, uh, uh, something similar to this, uh, where, of course, uh, the suggestion is children are a little more protected because of their upper airway response rather than their lower. But um, I haven't been supporting back to school, not on the epidemiology, but on the behavior of the parents. So uh, the parents weren't getting the idea of staying away and they weren't keeping social distancing. So the children being a risk factor for the staff in the schools, um, I think uh, it's probably low and it would be nice to have a sensor for them. I noticed that children are now being asked to have their temperature taken at the gate and have their hand hygiene. Um, it, the temperature I think is a public health message because they're not gonna pick up, um, 
many up, uh, but it'd be great if they had a system like that where they could uh, get the kids to breathe in. But I think it's more the staff and keeping the parents off the campus, but if they came on the campus, uh, having a breath test of some sort uh, is uh, what I see as more epidemiologically important over. Mary Louise, do you think the uh, young people could be useful for teaching the parents how to use the technology? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so I had used to have two young people at home and uh, they are very big into sustainability and Mother Earth. And they certainly taught my husband very, very rapidly how to use those recycled um, bags. So absolutely, we can use the kids to teach the parents not to come on campus, to hand hygiene, not to shake hands when they see each other at the gate and to, and to keep their distance. Yep, the kids are a great resource over. So to the last question, it's actually coming from Jim in Illinois in USA, and it's uh, addressed to Bill and Tanya. It says, um, in recent years, we've had a number of new infections, MERS, SARS, H1N1, and now COVID-19. What actions can nations take to prevent future novel infections becoming pandemics, the big one? Bill? I was going to ask Tanya to, to sort of address that first because I think um, right. <laughs> it's, a big, it's a big picture question and I'm happy to make comments after perhaps. Yeah, okay, Tanya. Now, oh, Bill. <laughs> um, look, we're always going to be at risk of emerging infections, epidemics and pandemics. And we know from experience that viruses in particular can jump from animals to humans. And if they become human adapted, they can spread very quickly as we're, particularly in non-immune populations as we're experiencing at the moment. One thing that has been attempted to be done in Australia and other countries, and it was really initiated after the 2009 flu pandemic, was to prepare so-called pandemic responsiveness plans. At the same time, uh, initiatives were put in place about rapid response research that needs to be done in the face of a pandemic or an epidemic. Even so, with the advent of COVID, there were many things that we've learned that meant that there were holes in our pandemic plans. So I think the first issue is really to have societies prepared as best they can be, and that's uh, with messaging to the public, but also preparedness in place in the health system and in the research hierarchies to respond rapidly when things emerge. The second point to make is that many of these emerging infections are originating in resource poor countries and therefore support for them and early uh, detection is clearly mandatory and it, it speaks back to the uh, integration and I guess collaboration across the globe when these things emerge. And thirdly, of course, is health system responses are quite variable in different places and trying to build a whole of system responses is important. The other element that's been looked at is to try and predict where virus and jump from animals to humans, but also identify hotspots, if you like, that particular attention should be focused on. And maybe I'll throw that one back to Bill. Bill. So, so briefly, I think Tanya's given a great overview of the processes and, and the approaches that we all agree with. Maybe I'll, I thought, give a, a bit of on the ground View because when this before the politics and before um, all the memes and everything, when this first came out, there were several things that we knew. We knew that a lot of uh, these infections do arise in China, more particularly in southern China, with things like influenza. We do know that a lot of them are around wet markets, um, and there was really a lot of you know very good discussion in how we could prevent it. Um, we knew that China had in place a process for detecting unexpected outbreaks of uh, pneumonia based around their experience with SARS and also with influenza. Um, and we knew that um, the use of or the introduction of um, uh, wild animals into these markets had was actually banned. But 
what's happened over the last 18 years since SARS is um, the outbreaks and, and again, taking it, the politics out of it and just talking about it in terms of the medicine, the outbreaks were not being notified for various reasons. Um, we knew that there were, I think they got up to 54 exemptions for um, wet markets. And so just on the ground, there were, there were a lot of these processes in place, but they weren't being used. And so the big message, I think, from me is, um, firstly, you know, don't eat wild animals. Um, and um, uh, certainly we've learned such a lot we need to apply it not only at a political level, and that's clearly very important at, a, at an administrative, but in a practical level. We need to actually apply it on the ground and we need to stick to it. And exactly as Tanya said, it, it needs to be a global. It's not, you know, uh, we're in a wealthy country and, and to say close the wet markets is a very easy thing to do, but that's got to be introduced at a pragmatic level. And if we can support that, if we can support that with, um, you know, enhance detection in other ways, then clearly that, that is part of our responsibility. So I think pragmatically, this didn't have to happen in many ways. Uh, there were in place the things that could have stopped it, but they weren't being put in place. And we need to look pragmatically at how that can be, that gap can be filled. Indeed, thank you very much, Bill. Well, that wraps it up. And let me just say that uh, when it comes to uh, the wet markets and the traffic animals, pangolins, is it 200,000 per year? And the trafficking of animals is the fourth largest trafficking expedition, well, illegal trade in the world, well over $20 billion a year. And uh, there is good work going on, as you in imply, for tracking this stuff, for finding where it's gone in, in Taronga Zoo, the Institute, where they've got a device that can actually look at the scales on the creature to find out where it's come from and more or less where it's been hidden. But I'm reminded final thoughts on the very old and the very new. In some ways, we had a warning of this in a book by a friend of mine called Laurie Garrett, who wrote The, Co the, the Coming Plague 30 years ago. And it's interesting looking at the last pages of that book for which he won the Pulitzer Prize, warning of this kind of thing exactly. And when it comes to the new, we've seen today so many different technologies, so many aspects of science with a set of capital letters, science coming together and teaching us stuff that we hardly were aware of in the public area, what, six weeks ago? And I think that suggests the future and the collaboration that's going on between so many institutions. Final thoughts now, please, from Ben Eggleton. Thanks, Robin. And I think I've got 60 seconds, but I might use five minutes if that's okay. But look, wonderful discussion, really stimulating. I want to thank the panel, um, really uh, a rock star group of clinicians, researchers, academics, and so what I'll try to do in three or four minutes is just pick up some of the highlights um, that I've captured along the way, um, really as a wrap up. So we had a great perspective from Dr. Bill Rollinson, um, really uh, very clear with his credentials, having covered SARS, MERS, H1N1, Ebola, SARS-2, and working with Justin. Um, very quickly segue to Justin's uh, perspective on rapid sensing. And I think right up front, we had that really uh, pointed question, what is the perfect sensor? And from Bill, we heard, and I tweeted this, um, we heard from Bill, well, we need to know if it's live virus, we need to know how much, uh, we need to know its genome, has it mutated? Um, we need more sensitivity. Um, is there residual RNAs that are alive or dead? Um, which I think I've just mentioned. So. That conversation evolved. We then heard from Tanya, Tanya Sorrell, sorry, Professor Tanya Sorrell, Tanya, who really just amplified that point, but said also, look, um, we need to know whether there's likelihood of further transmission. Um, and that really teased out an interesting uh, conversation that I'm sure we're going to follow up on. We had a bit of a discussion around infrared sensors, and I thought it was interesting to hear from Mary Louise uh, that well, thermal sensors sort of provide some value, but let's face it, they are very much a great public health messaging system. 
And so we talked a little bit about surveillance. Um, Mary Louise pointed out that it needed to be reasonably inexpensive, rapid, non-invasive, and a bit of a conversation around positive, negative, predicted value. Um, certainly we'll be following up on that. Justin went on to emphasize the economics of sensors, um, the economic imperative, and that as well as COVID-19, we need to be thinking about future proofing for future viruses, configuring to new viruses. And I think he made the point that many of these sensor architectures are indeed um, uh, reconfigurable in that way. Um, we talked a little bit about, can we uh, foreshadow that someone needs to be uh, tested? Um, this was an interesting discussion and we didn't converge uh, right away. Uh, there was an interesting point again from uh, Mary Louise referring to snoring, uh, particularly with kids. Um, and there's certainly scope for using devices at home, whether it's something you sleep on a mattress or a wearable. And we had a bit of a conversation about sensor fusion and whether sensor fusion created a more complete picture that allowed an individual to make that decision or in the hospital uh, there is a similar conversation. We talked about um, breath sensors. Um, we talked about the notion that dogs have been trained to, um, uh, I guess, detect for um, the infection. So let me just um, try to converge here. We talked about, again, sensor fusion, multiple sensors integrating together, virtual hospitals at home, diagnostics, at home, Tanya uh, and Wojtek both talked about public space, whether that's the hospital, whether that's um, trains, uh, wanted to know whether um, a train is in fact safe to, um, uh, to use. And we also talked about the fact that simply speaking, we needed to be able to manufacture these sensors at scale. So just because we're wrapping up, I think there's a lot we're going to try to uh, synthesize uh, following this conversation and uh, stay tuned. So we will circulate to those that have participated in this conversation, a summary that uh, we'll make available for public uh, use and we'll follow up with you. We thank you again for what has been a fascinating, stimulating conversation. Thank you, Robin Williams. Uh, thank you, Justin. Thank you to my NSSN colleagues. Thanks to the panel. You've been fabulous. And with that, I'll end this uh, fantastic forum and wish you all a safe um, weekend and hope to see you again soon in person.